Antinutrients are negative substances found in plant foods that impair human metabolic function. They can inhibit digestive enzymes, reduce mineral absorption, as well as vitamin absorption. If we want to answer the question of whether or not these plant-containing antinutrients should be included on a daily basis, looking at indigenous groups or traditional cultures and what they ate can answer a lot of questions. The main thing to keep in mind is these traditional groups consumed a minimum of 65% of their calories from animal foods. What this means is they got a large amount of bioavailable vitamins and minerals from these animal foods and the rest of the percentage of their calories would have been consumed out of necessity or for energy. The difference between a group of peoples that consumed 65% of their calories from animal foods and 85% of their calories from animal foods or even 95% in some cases was physical impressiveness. The more animal foods in the diet, the taller the person was and you know generally better hunting skills were associated with that. If you hear stories about you know, the Mongols were big and strong. Uh, the, when the Roman soldiers invaded Germany, they said the Germans were tall and strong. Uh, what, what else did they say about the Native Americans, the newcomers to America, spoke about how they could chase down bison on foot. Uh, very interesting stories about the physical impressiveness of these indigenous groups. That being said, yes, there are blue zones now, such as Sardinians, that consume smaller amounts of these animal foods and still consume high amounts of anti-nutrient containing plant foods and still live long healthy lives. So the main thing to take away from this video is going to be that there are certain anti-nutrients that definitely need to be avoided in large amounts and that there are various preparation methods that should be used to reduce the anti-nutrient content in certain foods. Uh, we'll start with glucosinolates which occur in cruciferous vegetables and the cruciferous vegetable family I think is originally from some sort of mustard seed and it's pretty much a bunch of modern vegetables that have all been created from an older one so it's kind of like unnatural to only be eating large amounts of cruciferous vegetables and you can actually like google and look up people getting goiter from consuming too much kale or eating uh, too many cruciferous vegetables but these have shown free radical damage in animal studies uh, in order to reduce the glucosinolate content you have to boil the vegetable and most people consume vegetables either lightly cooked or raw so the levels of these other substances that are produced by glucosinolates are generally not inhibited by cooking because they're just not cooked long enough. Isothiocyanates stimulate detoxification enzymes, inflammatory response, they interfere with DNA segregation resulting in cell death, they inhibit iodine uptake which can kind of be countered with a higher iodine intake but they also inhibit thyroid hormone and that can't be countered by anything if this is consumed in large amounts. You know, and consuming more iodine does not change that. Indoles inhibit ATP, energy metabolism, as well as estrogen metabolism. Nitriles stimulate detoxification enzymes, same inflammatory reaction, and they actually cause cyanide-related toxicity, which results in reduced appetite and food intake, impaired kidney function, decreased energy production, more blood clotting as well as an increased liver weight and can actually be obtained from cooked Brussels sprouts or large amounts of certain uh, cruciferous vegetables. So definitely a bunch of negative things that can be had from consuming cruciferous vegetables in incredibly large amounts especially if raw or lightly cooked. Lectins are a much bigger anti-nutrient that causes a lot of problems for people and lectins, saponins, and gluten are the main anti-nutrients associated with leaky gut and a lot of gut problems. Lectins in particular are contained in legumes, grains, dairy, and vegetable oils. Uh, they damage the intestines because they're attracted to the sugar in the cell and that pretty much causes cell damage and in some cases cell death. They commonly cause joint pain as well. Some tolerate lectins better than others but these can be reduced through traditional methods such as fermentation or soaking. Saponins are very similar to lectins in that they damage the intestinal lining. Uh, they also damage red blood cells, enzymes, inhibit enzymes, uh, thyroid function as well. And they have a foaming property. When saponins enter uh, the body, they foam up. And that's, that's what, part of what causes the cell damage. These are contained in soy, chickpeas, quinoa, asparagus, oats, onions, garlic, and tea. So consuming large amounts of improperly prepared oats, soy, quinoa, which is something vegans likely do, 
this can definitely contribute to some gut problems. Uh, chaconine and solanine are actually two things that are viewed as beneficial in small amounts, but uh, there's, if someone can find the study, I think there was a guy, a famous survivalist who ate too many potato spuds and died from some sort of toxin. I don't know if it was this one, but these inhibit the nerve synapse enzyme, acetylcholine stearase, uh, and they're found in large amounts in corn and potatoes. I haven't really seen too many negative things online about this because I don't think people consume large enough amounts of these foods raw. Solanine is the primary anti-nutrient found in nightshades. Uh, it inhibits the same nerve synapse enzyme that chaconine does. It disrupts cell membranes and can cause birth defects. It opens up the potassium channel of the mitochondria, decreasing membrane potential. What this essentially does is it increases the concentration of potassium in the cytoplasm, resulting in cell damage or even cell death. Isoflavones are the first anti-nutrient that we definitely need to be avoiding. These are found in soy, peanuts, chickpeas, fava beans, kudzu, alfalfa. In most cases, food that is modern, man-made, wasn't really available to humans until really recently. Uh, the main concern is the phytoestrogens in these foods. It's associated with reduced fertility in rats, cell death in embryos, early puberty in women, also a regular cycle, and women fed a soy formula had menstrual cramping as well as longer periods. It resulted in breast cells in male rats and altered brain development. Uh, I want to blame isoflavones and soy formula for a lot of the problems that I've personally had. Uh, I think it's something that's pretty much a poison. It alters our hormones, our system, and everything. Uh, I don't really want to go too much into that, but it's definitely something we need to be avoiding. Soy is poisonous. Uh, maybe even feeding it to animals isn't something we should be doing. Lignans are phytoestrogens that occur in seeds, grains, beans, and berries. Although you would think they might have similar effects to isoflavones, the amount of phytoestrogens that occur in foods like soy and peanuts eclipse lignans by like dozen to hundred fold in many, many cases. So although lignans still might be a concern, uh, specifically in consuming large amounts of seeds, grains, and beans, in more wild indigenous foods, I wouldn't worry too much as they're usually not consumed in any significant amount, especially during all seasons of the year. Uh, glutamates, MSG. Uh, this isn't really that big of a topic, but this is mostly focusing on the additive of MSG, not the MSG that naturally occurs in foods. Uh, the additive can be associated with asthma, headache, hives, angioedema, just like swelling of the skin, uh, just various like skin inflammation too, rhinitis, uh, psychiatric disorders, and convulsions in some cases. But they do occur naturally in foods. The reason meat tastes good, especially dry aged meat, is because it has high levels of umami. So do foods like mushrooms and tomatoes. So natural MSG is not necessarily a bad thing to consume, but additive is definitely, uh, you know, maybe not relating too much to anti-nutrients, but I figured I'd throw it in there. Gluten is a big one. Uh, gluten is an enzyme inhibitor, uh, and anything that inhibits enzymes impairs digestive function. If your body isn't producing enzymes to digest foods, what happens is the food kind of just ferments and sits in the stomach, causes damage to cells, it promotes the growth of negative gut bacteria. It's associated with leaky gut, autoimmune disease, allergic reactions, cognitive problems, joint pain, headaches, fatigue, and poor memory. I can personally vouch, you know, my father eats a lot of gluten and definitely has cognitive problems and poor memory. Uh, as well as a lot of people I, I've noticed now, uh, gluten might be a big factor in that. Uh, phytic acid and oxalates are the two big things that are spoken about in a negative light on a vegan or a vegetarian diet. and these inhibit various minerals. Uh, phytic acid being found in grains and legumes, oxalates being found in legumes and greens. Um, oxalates are also in high amounts in coconut. Uh, so although I've listed a lot of foods that these things are contained in, I've probably missed a few things. So if you guys are interested in looking up individual anti-nutrient profiles, uh, go ahead. Uh, I'll post all the information I have in the description, but there really isn't a lot of information on anti-nutrient content. And if you try to look up phytic acid content of nuts, the information is difficult to find. I know for sure macadamia nuts are lower in phytic acid than a lot of other nuts, but that doesn't mean that they're low in oxalates, for instance. I didn't put nuts for this too. Phytic acid is very high in nuts and seeds as well. But phytic acid primarily inhibits phosphorus, calcium, copper, iron, magnesium, zinc, and manganese. In regards to percentages, 
you know, phosphorus and calcium can be up to 80% and magnesium 40%. Uh, so not only is phytic acid inhibiting these minerals, oxalates also overlap for things like calcium and magnesium. So in a lot of cases, between the phytic acid inhibiting mineral absorption and oxalates binding to minerals, a lot of vegans and vegetarians are getting negligible amounts of minerals in their diet. Uh, in the case of phytic acid, vitamin A and vitamin C can help counteract it, but vegan and vegetarian diets are low in the animal form of retinoic acid vitamin A. That's why this is a problem in large amounts in diets without animal foods. Uh, they also inhibit digestive enzymes, amylase, trypsin, and pepsin. So not only is your starch digestion inhibited, so is your protein digestion. Uh, I, won't touch, I won't touch two more on oxalates, but again, guys, I do have studies for showing each of these and the inhibition of various mineral absorption. Biogenic and vasoactive amines are pretty much histamines in plant foods, and these occur from fermentation, improper storage, or decay and rotting. Uh, th th this can have heart rate problems, skin flushing, headaches, and scombroid poisoning is an example of uh, high histamine levels in fish. And that, that's from improper storage of fish. So this isn't necessarily uh, specific to plant foods, but it can occur in plant foods as well. Uh, mycotoxin and aflatoxin are from fungus. And this is specifically from food handling and storage. Coffee and chocolate are examples of two foods that I don't believe would not ever not have high amounts of these. So. If there's one reason to not consume coffee or chocolate, it might just be because of the mycotoxin and the aflatoxin. Whether or not you know different types of mold are problematic or not, it's safe to say that both coffee and chocolate are very high in phytic acid. They're foods that are very high in oxalates, very high in antinutrients in general, especially these biogenic and vasoactive amines. In addition to the mycotoxins, it's hard to justify consuming either of those foods. Uh, I'll let you guys read up more on that if you're interested in it yourself. Uh, the salicylates are found in plants and spices, and although there's been negative associations with them, there is sparse evidence. Just something I wanted to throw out there for you guys. And these are anti-nutrients that can have drastic effects on some people, but aren't really talked about a lot. So alpha amylase inhibitors are found in grains, flowers, and breads. Uh, these cause pancreatic problems in animal models, and could very likely be a reason that a lot of people are getting pancreatic cancer now, just a high grain diet. Protease inhibitors found in legumes, greens, nuts, and grains impair protein and peptide digestion. Could be a reason a lot of vegans need to consume protein powders to not be deficient in protein. And also probably why a lot of vegans have naturally lower muscle mass if they're not taking steroids and lifting weight. Tannins can be enzyme inhibitors, cause protein deficiency, gastrointestinal distress, trypsin inhibitors, mainly associated with mineral deficiencies in children and are contained in grain products. Sulfites, you know, cider, wine, dried fruit tend to be added. Uh, several reports of reactions to sulfites, definitely problematic for some people. I know that was big years ago. Uh, benzoates, uh, which are added to sodas, jams, sweets, pickles, certain preserved foods. It's an antimicrobial that can cause hives, asthma, and just various skin problems. So uh, this video is a little bit longer than I wanted it to be. Uh, I mean, the main two things to keep in mind are we absolutely should be avoiding isoflavones and mycotoxins. Various other anti-nutrients can be reduced with soaking, sprouting, various cooking and fermentation methods. But I think the important thing, as I said earlier, is that your diet has a base amount of fat-soluble vitamins. And if you do choose to include a plant food, uh, try to buy a high quality indigenous natural version of that food. You know, don't go to the supermarket and buy a 50 pound bag of white rice. Go, you know, buy the local Minnesota wild rice that costs like $10 for a half a pound bag. You know, these foods are super expensive if you want to buy high quality plant foods. That's why I tend to stick primarily to a carnivore diet. It's simply that these wild plant foods are just too expensive and too difficult to obtain. I know Australia is known for having high quality uh, like plant foods and large amounts of wild plant foods, but uh, New York is a little far from. So thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you guys like the video, please share it. Um, if you'd like to support the channel, that's the best way to do it. Uh, if you guys would like to reach out to me for anything related to uh, maybe you want to know how to do your makeup, uh, shoot me an email for a consultation, 
Uh, send me a message through the contact form on my website. And if you guys want to look at some plant foods that are healthy for you, I have some on my Amazon shop that you can check out. And you don't necessarily have to buy them. I don't really want you guys to buy them from my Amazon shop, especially certain things like blueberries. But they're listed in there, so you could say, oh, well, this is decent, this is decent. And keep in mind they were always eaten for a source of energy. If indigenous groups could have obtained more of their calories from animal foods, they would have preferred to eat almost entirely animal foods in many cases, and maybe only 5 to 10% of their calories from plant foods. But uh, before I go on anymore, thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you feel like I missed anything, uh, just feel free to let me know. Uh, I'm sure there's something, it's just a, such a broad topic to cover. Uh, you guys like my little drawing here? This guy does not like broccoli.